I fix and flip houses virtually all over the country. That means most of the deals I never actually see in person, and I get a lot of questions about how I manage the rehabs and contractors on my remote flips. So on this video, I'm gonna break it down for you and even use a real deal I just bought in Missouri as a case study. You'll even hear a live conversation with my general contractor. All of that and more, coming up. This video is brought to you by 10K Club, a program that pays you $10,000 for finding ugly houses. Learn more at my10kcheck.com. If you're new here, I'm Jerry Norton and I went from dead broke to millionaire flipping houses. And after doing a thousand deals, I created this channel to help you master the art of wholesaling and flipping real estate so you can live your dream life. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified when new videos are released. Rehabbing houses remotely or long distance is not easy. Heck, it's not easy when it's right in your backyard and you go there every day, but it can be done and it can be done successfully. I've been doing fix and flips remotely now for over seven years. So on this video, I'm gonna share with you how I do it and what you can do to be successful as well and some things to watch out for and avoid. But before we dive into the wonderful world of rehabbing, I wanna make a very important point about fixing up houses to flip. The point of fix and flip is not to make the nicest home. The point is to create a home that the market will give you the biggest reward for your rehab investment. And when I say market, I'm referring to retail buyers. Never forget, the flipper that wins at this game is the one who makes the most money, not necessarily the one who creates the nicest house. Anyone can over renovate. Anyone can overspend and make an amazing house and then lose money on the deal. That's easy to do, but you won't be around very long. What's hard and the genius is to not over renovate and lose money and not under renovate and leave money on the table, but to find the sweet spot that gives the greatest return on investment for the given time, energy, and effort. And that is gonna vary from market to market and neighborhood to neighborhood and house to house. Now I hope you grasp that concept. To illustrate, let me give a few examples. If I finish a basement and it costs me $15,000, but the market will only pay me $15,000 more for a finished basement, then that obviously would not be worth the investment. However, if carpet costs $5,000, but to refinish wood floors costs me $8,000, but with wood floors over carpet, the house sells for $15,000 more, then the additional $3,000 budget was worth spending the money to refinish the floors. Now I'm working on a little starter home right now and we decided that we can put in vinyl flooring in the kitchen and bathroom instead of ceramic tile and save several thousand dollars and the market won't penalize me for it. So how do you know what you should fix up and what the market is willing to pay for and not pay for? Now I'm gonna show you so keep watching. Before you can even think about finding and managing contractors, you have to get crystal clear on the list of items to fix. This is known as the scope of work. Deciding on the scope of work may seem intimidating because a lot of times you don't even know what you want, let alone be able to explain it to a contractor. So let me share with you two easy ways to solve this issue that I do with my remote flips. Method number one is to copy what's already been done. With every rehab I do, I try to find a recently sold home in the same neighborhood that was renovated by a flipper that sold for the price I'm hoping to sell my deal for and then copy what they did on their rehab. That way, I don't need to guess on what to do or reinvent the wheel. That flipper already proved it. He bought the house, renovated it, and sold it, and the market doesn't lie. So assuming that comp is similar to your deal, all you need to do is copy what that flipper did on the rehab, and you'll get the same result. All of the guesswork is gone. So let me illustrate by taking a property in Belton, Missouri that I'm currently rehabbing. This is a four bedroom, 1800 square foot ranch with an attached one car garage. And as you can see, this house is a mess and needs a lot of work. So knowing that I have to put this house back together in order to flip it is obvious, but since I have never flipped a house in that neighborhood in Belton, Missouri, I have no idea of the level of rehab that's needed. In other words, what kind of flooring, kitchen cabinets, countertops, etc., do I need to do in order to flip this house for a profit? But taking a look at the comps in the neighborhood, I found this house right here that a flipper sold. It's a four bedroom, 1900 square foot ranch with a one car attached garage. It's like identical to my house and check it out. 
It recently sold for $200,000, which is my after repair value. So since my house is identical, all I need to do is match the finishes to this house. And theoretically, I should be able to sell my house for $200,000. So let's take a quick look at it. It has refinished wood floors throughout. The kitchen is a basic cabinet with a small island and looks like granite countertops, no backsplash, stainless steel appliances. It's got a brick fireplace. They painted the flat panel doors and trim, which saves a lot of money. The bathroom has a plastic tub insert instead of tile. That saved a lot of money and a really cheap vanity and sink. This house is basically a Home Depot special. Seeing this got me really excited because there isn't anything crazy going on here. It's a very basic rehab using bottom of the line finishes. So that means I just need to match this house on my rehab. Next, let me share with you method number two for how to determine the scope of work. And then using my example, I'll walk you through the steps I did to create a scope of work and get bids on the rehab on this deal in Missouri. So method number two is to get a local top selling agent to walk the property and give her expert opinion on what to do and what not to do. Now this is typically how I hire my listing agent who will list and sell the property later after the rehab is complete. I involve that agent in the decision making process from day one. Not any agent, but a top selling agent knows exactly what buyers want and what you must do on the rehab and what you can get away with. In fact, I have a video where I'm on the phone with a top selling agent discussing the scope of work on a rehab project I did remotely in Leesburg, Georgia. Now on that video, you hear the agent explaining to me exactly what I should do and not do to get the best return on my investment on that rehab. Now that video will really help you visualize what I'm explaining. I'll put the link to that video in the description below and you can watch it later. So going back to my Missouri deal, let me walk through the steps for how I created a scope of work and got bids from contractors. First of all, once I had an executed offer with the seller, I had a full 10 days for due diligence. During that time was my window to solidify my rehab plan and my budget. Since this deal was on market, I told the listing agent who was also my buyer's agent that I needed her to find and coordinate four general contractors to bid the rehab for me. Since she was local, she had those connections and coordinated them to get access to the property and provide written bids. Now, if the deal would have been off market, I would have had to research and find my own contractors to bid the rehab. Now, you're not gonna believe how easy it is to create the scope of work. All I did was provide the Zillow link with the pictures to our model comp and told the contractor that I wanted them to bid making my house look exactly like that model comp. I basically say, give me a price to make it look like this comp. So during that 10 day window, I got four bids and my best bid came back at 65,000. Now this was a problem because I had originally budgeted 55,000. So I had the agent take my bid and go back to the seller and request a price reduction of $10,000, which the seller agreed to do. And I moved forward and bought the house. So now the project is underway as we speak, but remember I'm not physically there. So managing the rehab presents some challenges as you can imagine. So let me spend the rest of this time on this video explaining how I manage rehabs remotely. But honestly, I follow these same best practices with my local projects too. So even if you rehab houses in your backyard, you can treat it like a remote deal. So first of all, it's important to understand the nature of contractors. Right now, as of this recording, contractors are really busy. So you need to understand the squeaky wheel rule. There's an old saying that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Now that means whoever makes the most noise gets the most attention. With contractors, their clients screaming the loudest get priority. And since I'm not there, I can easily get moved to a lower priority. So my goal is to make the most noise. Here's what that looks like. Let's say it's Monday and the plumber is scheduled for Friday. On Monday, you call the plumber to confirm he'll be there on Friday and he confirms he'll be there. Now you don't say another word and Friday comes and goes and no plumber because he has some other urgent thing come up. Now that's not the right way to do it. The right way is on Monday, you call the plumber to confirm he'll be there on Friday and he confirms he'll be there. On Tuesday, you call again to confirm he'll be there on Friday. And this time you reiterate how critical it is that he's there on Friday. On Wednesday, you call again and do the same thing. On Thursday, you call again and reiterate how important it is that he does not miss his Friday deadline. But then Friday comes 
and he's behind on his other projects or he has three other clients that he also overcommitted to and now he has to decide whose work is he gonna do on Friday and who's he gonna blow off and guess who the contractor is gonna choose? The client who's been making the most noise. Now, once you understand that about contractors, you have to make sure you are making more noise than anyone else so you stay top priority. And once you've identified the contractor that you wanna hire, be sure to get a contractor agreement in place. Now, my contract I use has like 17 things that you wanna make sure are in place with your general contractor, and you know me, I'll give my exact contractor agreement to you for free. I'll put the download link in the description box below for you. So now let's talk about how to manage that general contractor remotely. Since you're not there, you need someone to be your eyes and ears on the ground and babysit the GC. I call this boots on the ground and I like to have my listing agent who I've already identified to stop by the property several times a week to take pictures and video as well as give me an update. Or sometimes I'll hire someone from Craigslist or Facebook to stop by and do pictures and video. In fact, I did an entire video explaining how to find boots on the ground. I'll put the link to that video in the description below and you can watch it later. Now let's talk about how to pay contractors. With every contractor who works on my project, I need three things. Two of the three things are required by the IRS. The first is a W-9 form. Now you only need this once per year, but a W-9 allows your bookkeeper to 1099 the contractor at the end of the year, and it shows the IRS that you paid that contractor. Now this is required for tax purposes. The second IRS requirement is that you have a written invoice from the contractor in the amount of the draw or payment. Trust me when I say this, if you ever get audited by the IRS, you'll be thankful you have documented invoices. Ask me how I know. In fact, don't ask me how I know. I don't wanna tell you about the $42,000 penalty I had to pay years ago for not keeping good records. Okay, the third thing you need is a lien waiver for each draw or payment made to the contractor. A lien waiver waives the right for a contractor to put a mechanics lien on your property. Now, gathering all of this paperwork used to be a nightmare when rehabbing houses, but not anymore. I created a paperless contractor management center that comes standard with my deal management system, Flipster. And if you've never heard of Flipster, it's a cloud-based, all-inclusive platform to help you organize, streamline, and automate all of the steps to wholesaling and flipping houses. And it even includes tools for fix and flip, and the contractor management center is one of my favorite tools. Let me show you real quick. Once you create a property that you're gonna rehab, the system creates a unique link for contractors to upload and submit your W-9s, invoices, and lien waivers. It even comes with the paperwork for the contractor to use. Now, once a contractor uploads a form, it automatically saves it inside your Flipster system under that specific property. Now, this is not only completely paperless, but it keeps you super organized. Now, Flipster is the only way to run your business at top efficiency. So to learn more and see it in action, just go to getflipster.com. Aside from the paperwork, I typically pay contractors via ACH direct deposit once a week on Fridays, only for work that's already completed. This ensures I never get behind on a contractor, which is a recipe for disaster. Now, I covered a lot on this video, but if you're still here, I have a special treat for you. Stick around if you'd like to hear a live recorded conversation with a contractor that I ended up hiring to GC my project. It's a pretty long conversation, but it'll give you a really good idea of how to explain proper expectations when hiring your GC. So take a listen now, and I'll see you on the next video. Yeah, so what I typically look for on one of my, you know, remote fix and flips like this, since I'm not there, is I look for a GC who can just run the entire project. Mm -hmm. um, now, most GCs have kind of some in-house stuff that they specialize in. They may have a crew or two and they do a certain percentage of work. Mm -hmm. um, and then, or none, you know, they could just have none of that and they just, they just sub out everything. Um, I, pay all, I pay all contractors directly, so I wouldn't pay you and then you pay them. Um, right. You would have to prove their draws, so we don't we wouldn't pay somebody who didn't you know complete the work on time or satisfactory. So you would be there to I mean part of your role as GC would be you know let's get some bids, let's make sure we're picking the right contractor, we're paying the right price, a fair price, uh, scheduling, making sure they're showing up, making sure the timeline's moving along. You know if something can get done, it should be getting done. So. You know, yeah. outside stuff can be happening while inside stuff, you know, just the right order of things, 
keeping the thing moving. So that way it's, it's not a, you know, nine month rehab. It's a three month rehab or whatever it should be. Exactly. And then, um, and then there's a fee that we agree on for you to kind of just take over the whole project or manage the whole project. Um, I would pay you in draws as well. So at, at certain milestones, um, I would pay you a draw for the GC work. But it's just eyes and ears on the ground, you know, making sure you're, you're out there as often as you need to be to um, solve problems, check on contractors, make sure they're showing up. The stuff we're unaware of or, or you're not sure about, we would be, let's get, you know, let's get three plumbers to come out here and bid it. Or if you got a go-to guy you really, really like and you feel super confident in and we like their number, we'll just, we can go with that guy. You know, I'm not, there's not a exact science to something like this because there are issues with it. But um, if we kind of have a ballpark of like, hey, you know, we, sh we should be spending about this much to get this house turned around. Um, the way I decide the finishes is I find a comp that I want to match that is in the neighborhood, which I've got one that's pretty much the same house. Right. And I looked at their finishes and quality. You know, we go through the pictures and we say, okay, I, I see what kind of finishes they're doing <clears throat> they they got uh 200 grand for this house as a flip let's match what they did let's just copy what they did yeah so we're going to put in you know the same kind of counters same kind of cabinets same kind of bathroom same kind of tile mm -hmm. uh, you know some appliances but they don't need to be but you know like we can kind of look at what that comp did and then that gives us and then model it yeah, because you don't want to overcompensate or undercompensate no. for things that are already been produced in the area. See, I mean, like no, I the saying, goal the goal is not to make the nicest house that you because right. anybody can spend money, right? That's easy. Yeah. It's it's how do we spend the right money to hit our comp, hit our value, and I think it's two hundred thousand is what we could hit on this if we do it right, mm -hmm. and not do not do over, not do under. The genius is in doing just the right amount of work and nothing more. So. Right. Sometimes that means, for me, sometimes that means paint the cabinets and we don't even, you know, we don't replace the cabinets, we paint them. Now, brand new cabinets would definitely make the house nicer, but, but if the market doesn't compensate me or it compensates me the same if I just paint the existing cabinets, then we do that, right? So, exactly. yeah, yeah. you know, it. it's the investor side of this is where the genius is. It's how do I not underdo it? How do I not overdo it and hit the mark? But right. on this project... You know, I would say 75% of it's just getting it to the finish point. You know, like right. there's all these issues with this thing. We got to get, we got to get all the rough done and get the, get the thing put back together before we even need to worry about, I mean, before, so I would say three quarters of the budget's on just getting this thing to, to finish level. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying is like, you know, because the condition of it, like when I was walking around, I mean, there's, you know, circle cut holes in the floor. There, I mean, there's a lot of questionable. It was a, it was a rehabber who ran out of money, like a live in rehabber or something okay, like it yeah. was a, so it, this is definitely the situation. Like, you know, when your car breaks down and you try to fix it yourself and then you take it to the mm. mechanic and the mechanics like, what kind of mess is going on here? That's what this right. is. Your, uh, finishes are right, easy. So kind of yeah, finishes are because they're, because it's not high. This, this is not high quality finishes out there. Right. Like the comp right. I looked at, they did plastic insert in the tub, you know, like yes. very Home Depot finishes is all we got to exactly. do. The biggest thing is just there's the unknowns, right? Every time you rehab, there's unknowns. So what right. I try to do is I try to say, well, I know there's all these unknowns going on that we're not going to really know to a penny what it's going to cost to fix until we just dig in. Yes. But, you know, do I have a healthy enough budget to cover it? And I think right. I think I do. I think I mm -hmm. do. So, you know, if we can be, if we can be kind of like aiming for our overall budget and then we dig in and, and just, and just tackle issues as we go, I think we'll be okay. The biggest thing and where everybody wants to cut corners is, is, um, in the bidding process. So mm -hmm. like, Hey, I'm just going to go with the, with the first bid I get, or, Hey, I know somebody I'm going to use them. It's a lot of work to get three or four bids on everything. You know, you got to get them out there. They got to, you got to chase them down. You got to look at their timeline. You got to see, are they qual? Do, do they do good work? You know, we're not looking for the cheapest guy, but we don't want to overpay either. Right. And all of that. That's where the real work comes in because every dollar, every dollar saved over, you know, 30 subs, it turns into thousands of dollars in your rehab budget. Right. 
So part of the GC, like what I'm willing to pay for a GC is just someone that's willing to do the work to get the right subs in there. And so there's two things. There's, there's obviously pricing, quality, and time. Correct. Right. Those are the three things that we have to always try to match to do good, a good rehab. And it's not easy because, because, you know, really good guys are expensive, really fast guys. Right. The fast guys aren't cheap. The slow guys are cheap, but then you got quality, like they're cheap, but their quality is not good. Like how do we mm -hmm. find, you know, you're a contractor, the balance is always the hardest part to yeah. find. It, but, it is a challenge. But I'm not there, so I can't run out there, you know, and that's not how I do it. So I, I've got to get the right GC who's got the bandwidth, first of all, to put the tension into the deal mm -hmm. and and just make sure that we get this thing every day. We're making progress. It's moving along. We're tackling issues. We're getting bids. And so I'm, I, I'll communicate, you know, several times a week on any kind of decisions and then you're, you're just, you provide all the information, we make a decision and then we go. And then the one thing that I, that I really understand well and I make sure happens is the money's gotta flow. So I'm, I don't ever wanna be the bottleneck with money, meaning I'll keep paying as fast as we need to pay. So if, if the painter's gotta get paid, you know, before the paint dries to get them out there, fine, mm -hmm. right? We'll do draws. I set everybody up on direct deposit you would just authorize a payment. We, we pay a sub, we keep those guys moving. A lot of stuff you gotta be thinking a month out because it takes forever now to get materials, cabinets and appliances, everything's 30, 60 days out nowadays. Cause mm -hmm. of, since COVID it's like the major delays in stuff. Mm -hmm. Contractors need scheduled way ahead of time. That timeline has to be communicated all the time. You know, it's like, it's like the way, the way I treat it is and the way you're gonna have to do this is it's the squeaky wheel, right? Squeaky wheel gets the grease. The more noise you make, the more subs respond. So if the guy tells you he's gonna be there Friday and it's Monday, you better call him Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday and ask him again if he's gonna be there Friday. And he's gonna say, I already told you I'm gonna be there Friday. And you're like, I know, I'm calling you again. Oh yeah, you I know? do that anyway with my guys. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. hey, I just gotta make sure if I don't hear anything for a couple of days or we're getting close to, you know, to Hey, we're starting Friday. Yeah, I know what you mean. My projects yeah, I right the now, I, the this is like fifty percent of the of the time. I'll be there Friday. I'll be there Friday. I'll be there Friday. Friday comes. Where are you? I'm not. The, I'll be there Monday. Right? Like, come on. You know. The, but this is the game right now because everybody's busy. Correct. So yes. you know, I've never in my life of doing this seventeen years have had to beg contractors to come work for me, but I do because it's like yeah. they don't care. They got other work. Look, if we can get this down and we can do a good job, and if Jerry makes money, he'll buy more houses and we'll all have more work and everybody wins. Right. You know, but we gotta be thinking big picture all the time and communicate that because contractors tend to be very short sighted. They think about the job in front of them, not, you know, hey, I'll do a dozen deals with this guy this year if I do a good job, show up on time, do good work, give good pricing. Mm -hmm. So that's, that I try to communicate that as much as possible with everybody so that they are constantly reminded of the big picture.